funeral services, but is in fact verses that should encourage and inspire us to do, to continue to do, and to live in the work of the Lord. Chapter 15, verse 15. I'm sorry, 57. I said I wanted to do two. Here's what verse 57 says. It says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brother, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Let me read 58 one more time. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Turn to your neighbor and point at him. You got to touch the point at him and say, neighbor, keep working. Your reward is waiting on you. Amen. 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 God bless you. If you're here, you may be seated today in the house of the Lord. And for those of you who are listening, if you're standing, you can be seated as well. Uh, as again, as I just said, this particular verse of scripture uh, oftentimes is, is utilized at funeral services, but particularly these verses from 51 through 57. Uh, oftentimes, and even I can plead guilty to this myself, I have read verse 58 in some ways as an afterthought to what was presented in chapter 15, verses 51 through 57. Uh, in these verses, we see that Paul establishes for the believer, the child of God, the reality and the power and the impact of the resurrection. The reason why Paul included this 15th chapter in this letter was because those individuals in Corinth had been sending uh, questions they had been uh, asking um, uh, those pastors that served in Corinth to go back and get some clarity uh, from Paul in regards to the resurrection. Now, the same thing happened in the book of 1 Thessalonians because the Thessalonican church was concerned as well uh, about the resurrection. They were concerned that their loved ones uh, that had died uh, as a result of their death would not see uh, Jesus as a result of their physical death. Uh, Paul comforted them. Uh, as a result of their concerns or their questions, letting them know that their physical death would in no way separate them uh, from the resurrection. And he closed that out in about the fourth, fifth, fourth verse, chapter rather, uh, by reminding them that one day Jesus would come and there would be a, a trumpet sounding. And in that moment of trumpet sounding, that the dead in Christ would rise and those who were alive would be called up to meet him in the air as well. Here in Corinth, however, there was a different reason for their questions. They uh, were not asking questions out of love. They were not asking questions out of concern for loved ones. But the people in Corinth were asking questions because they had been approached by uh, others, by uh, learned men, by philosophers, and, the and, and both people who dealt in theory to challenge the reality of the resurrection. Uh, there were those in Corinth who uh, had great amounts of education and who put a lot of faith in the flesh man as opposed to the spirit man and put no faith at all in God. And as a result, they came into Corinth and began, and some of them lived in Corinth actually, began to try uh, to separate the Corinthian from the reality of the resurrection. They wanted to, to make the Corinthian think that everything was happening here in this world and there was nothing in the world to come. Uh, they wanted them to say there's no reason to live right, to live righteously, to do any work that God told them to do because they may as well enjoy themselves because this was all there was to offer. And, and, and in this letter, Paul wrote a number of things addressing even chastising the people at Corinth, but he took a great deal of time in expressing a response to this question about resurrection because he knew that for the child of God to minimize or marginalize resurrection would cause one to live a different life. He said, if you don't believe that Jesus died and God raised him from the dead, then what good is your faith in God? I wish I had my kid right there. Y'all hear? He, he said, if you 
want to put the resurrection on, on the table and put it to the side, then you have effectively destroyed or in your own self uh, marginalized or, or systematically minimized what God has done. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you pull resurrection off the table, that statement has no impact on us. It causes us to live differently, to act differently, to think differently, and to love differently. So, and, and as moved by the Holy Spirit, Paul wrote this response in chapter 15 uh, to address, and if you would, just give me about three or four minutes to address what he shared in regards to the resurrection. First of all, he said that there would be a resurrection in verse 51, if you can join me there. He said, I'll tell you a mystery. I had a debate with one of my good friends the other day about the concept of mystery. Mystery is not that God has hidden something. Mystery means that God is, has, has yet to reveal or is in the process of revealing something. In other words, God, God didn't say, I'm going to hide this, but he can't find it. He said, I'm going to place it so that they cannot get it until they come into this relationship with me. God says, I'm going to reveal it. But it only comes as a result of this relationship that I am initiating with those my people. He says, I'll show you mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Paul begins to touch on that concept of death. He said, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. He says, some will die. He said, but the reality is those that die and those that live will undergo a transformative process that will prepare them for what God has for us. Look at verse 52. He says, it's going to happen in a moment, he says, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump, for the trump shall sound. And the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. He touches on this. Uh, he connects the dots of what he said in First Thessalonians. He said, Trump will sound. It's the last trump. And he says, in that moment, it won't take but a second. He said, the dead who have died will be raised in a different way than when they died. How is that? Paul says, when they died the first time, there was corruption. If you go to any cemetery, there are remains of who was. But Paul says, when this trumpet shall sound, in the twinkling of an eye, there will be a new body that is raised. It won't be like the old one because it will be incorruptible. It won't. It is to be raised incorruptible and it will be changed. It will be a whole new body. Verse 53, he says, for this corruptible, he's talking about what we got on now, must put on incorruption, that which won't fade away. And he said, this mortal must put on immortality. I want to talk about this for a moment because it's important for us to know this to understand verse 58. He said, this mortal, that's what will will go away. We must put on immortality that which never goes away. Verse 54, he says, now so, when this corruptible, this body, have put on incorruption, what we're going to get, and this mortal shall put on immortality, he says, then something's going to be brought to pass. What is that, Paul? Then shall be brought to pass the same that written, that is written, death is swallowed in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? He says this right here. He says, because of what's going to take place in the resurrection, he says, because of what's going to take place in these physical bodies that will be made new, he says, we must then rejoice. We must, we should rejoice in the fact that death, that thing that scares most folk the most, that death will have lost its ability to cause fear and have lost its ability to, to be victorious over us because it will be taken away as a result of the resurrection. I want somebody to think about that for a minute. Folks hear them. I hear people all the time. I ain't scared to die. Well, they are. Because if you're not in Christ, you should fear death. Because death is coming for everyone. The reality is for the child of God, however, death is a jumping off place into eternity. For the unsaved and for those who don't know the Lord, death is a jumping off place. But it's a jumping off place to an eternity separated from God. I wish I had a little more time here because I will really dig a little deeper. He says that we must, as children of God, must know that as a result of the promise and the reality of the resurrection, which was demonstrated first with Jesus, he says, we can know without a doubt that death has lost its sting. It's lost its sting. I, um, not too long ago, and I don't know if this is true or not, but not too long ago, I was coming out of the house and a bee was flying around. I remember my mama told me when I was little, they don't sting in October. And I always wondered, how would the bee know when it was October? 
How did the bee know when to count the ten? For whatever reason, I walked right past that bee because I felt that that bee couldn't bite me because it was October. And here's the reality. And whether that bee can bite me or not, I don't know. But what I do know is death no longer can hurt me because of the resurrection that is for me. It's a death where I sing. Grave, where is my victory? It's a grave. The grave has no victory over us now. Because the grave can't hold us the same way that the tomb that was borrowed for Jesus from Joseph or Arimathea didn't hold him. He was on the first and said, the sin of death. The sin, he said, sin now. Let's talk about this sin. He said, sin, which used to be that which sentenced us to death, has now been dealt with by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And the, and, the, and the reality of the strength of sin is the law. The law, that which we could not accomplish, has now been dealt with because as a result of Jesus' death, we are declared righteous. And as a result of his resurrection, we are now able to live by the power of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, sin cannot hold us, and the strength of sin, which is the law, cannot confine us. That's what he's saying. Now look at verse 7. Paul gets happy. Who wrote this letter probably when he began in frustration. Now he's gone to the place of excitement. Paul had to have been a little upset that he had to deal with certain things uh, as a result of the immaturity of the folk in Corinth. But as a result of repeating and sharing with them the reality of the resurrection, Paul got happy. Let me call and do a station break. When the children of God begin to sound the word of God, it will make you happy. Has anybody ever witnessed to somebody and in the middle of your witness said, you got happy? You got happy because you know that what you were saying was strong, cold, true. You got happy. You, you almost wanted to shock as you sat with them the reality of the power and the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why I tell somebody, if you ain't witnessing, you missing out because when you witness, you're reminded of how good God is. When you witness, you're reminded of what? God has done and what God is doing and what God will do. When you witness it, God will do something to you as it does something to them. Paul got happy in verse 57. He said, but thanks be to God. Paul, I can see him. I mean, while he was writing, I can see him at his desk. He, could join. he was he was jotting out these notes and writing this and I can imagine the pastors were standing there waiting on him to give him the letter, but while he was writing, he stepped back from the desk and said, thanks be to God. Thank you. He said, thank you, Lord. Thank you. The death don't mean the same thing it meant to me when I was studying on the Gamaliel. He said, death don't have the same impact on me that it did when I was focusing on being one of the sons of the Benjamin. Thank you. The death doesn't scare me anymore. He said, thanks be to God who gives us the victory. The victory that we have as Christians, is not earned by the warfare of the world. Battles are fought all the time. But I've learned that there's never a winner in battle. You can ask the United States how much money we spent in Afghanistan. And when we tried to pull out, we had to spend the same amount of money that we spent being there 20 years. You can talk to anybody who served in Vietnam, Korea, World War II, Whatever war, it, it, it's the cost of war never results in victory, except with Jesus Christ. He gives us the victory. I like that part too. We didn't earn it. We can't buy it. It's given to us. He gives us. God gives us the victory. And he gives us the victory. Not through our intellect, not through our money, not through our connections, not because of where we are. I want to be clear about that. If, if we would give and had to get victory because we had a certain amount of money, none of us would have enough. If we were going to get victory through our connections, nobody, none of us would know the right person. If we had to get victory through our intellectual capacity, none of us would be strong enough. God gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. In other words, as we accept Jesus as our Savior, we receive the victory. The victory over sin, victory over death. Now, Paul says in verse 10, therefore, 
Paul says, in effect, as a result of the reality of the resurrection, as a result of the fact that death no longer is superior, as a result of the fact that the grave is no longer the end, as a result of the fact that death, the sin caused death, has now been moved as a result of the strength of sin, which is the law, having been made weak and broken, he says, and as a result of the fact that we are given victory through Jesus. He said, there's something we got to do. Look what he says. He says, therefore, my beloved brother, he said, be ye steadfast. If you would, tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, be steadfast. And I'll say, man, tell him, like, me and the employer, be steadfast. If I have more time, I'll tell you to tell him, stop wavering. Stop worrying. Stop wondering. But I ain't going to tell you to tell them that they might get mad. He said, be steadfast. That's what steadfast means. Steadfast means holding your ground. Holding your ground. Um, and I'm not talking about wrestling that comes on WWE, but if you ever watch the Olympic wrestling, there are certain rules and regulations that people come out and they do tap hands. And then they go back and they take a position. And that position indicates that they're not going to back up at all. Both of them take that position. They back and they take this position that says, I am not going to give an inch. I'm going to hold my ground and I'm going to be firm in my position. I'm going to be strong in my position. But here's the part that's best. I'm going to be confident in my position. When I was in high school, I went to high school with a guy who was a four-time state champion wrestler. He wrestled and never lost a wrestling match in four years. He fought, he wrestled opponents who were more experienced. He wrestled opponents who had more athleticism. He wrestled opponents that had more, more um, um, ex, uh, um, physical ability, more strength, more upper body strength, more lower body strength. He told me this. I saw him recently. He says, I, I, I wrestled, I wrestled a long time. He said, and I said, well, what was the secret to winning all your wrestling matches from ninth grade to 12th grade? He said, I came out with confidence, not expecting or not believing that the person but on the other side had as much commitment to what they were trying to do as me. He said, he said, I know they were stronger, but they didn't work out as long as I did. He said, I know that they were quicker, but they didn't run as far as I did. He said, I know that I that, that there were some who had more experience when I first started. He said, but I know that they did not have what they he said they didn't want it bad enough. Could I talk to the Christian? We gotta have that same level of confidence, but not in ourselves. We must have that level of confidence in God. We must say that what I want is a relationship with God. And I know that as a result of my relationship with God through Jesus Christ, that something's going to happen. He said, I'm going to be steadfast. The world may promise me stuff, but I'm not giving up because I know that I trust the Lord. The world may say, if you try it this way, you will get that fast. He said, but I'm not going to move. I'm going to hold my position in the Lord. We must say, he said, he reminded me, he said, I, I always knew that at the end of the match, I came in, he said, Thomas, knowing that at the end of the match, I was going to win. We got to know, when we deal with stuff in this world, that the victory has already been won. We got to have confidence that, that we, because we know that eternal life is already ours. Can I say that one more time? Eternal life is already Hours. We we are walking not toward death. We're walking toward eternal life. And so with that confidence, we should change our perspective on how we live. I'm going to get to what we talk about. He says, be steadfast. That's the first thing. Be confident in God and confident in our eternal life and be confident in that we will be raised up, first of all, because Jesus did it. And second of all, because God promised it for us because we are in Jesus. He said, don't be shaken. That's what I'm moving me. Don't be shaken. Don't be agitated. Don't, 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 don't let what the world says is about to happen shake you. I don't care how what happens. The world, the news will make you sick if you're not very careful. You, know, you watch five minutes of news, that's really enough for anybody because the news gives you all the bad news. But we have some good news every day that eternal life is 
God was here. They may say uh, that, uh, that, that, uh, that the economy is now, but I know I got eternal life. They may say that the climate is changing, but we have eternal Prime is up, but we got eternal life. Don't be agitated. Don't be tempted. See, in Korea, the believers were tempted by those who said, just live like you want to live. We can't be tempted like that. We got to say, I'm going to live like God wants me to live. He just be steadfast. Then he says, unmovable. Unmovable and steadfast are similar. The difference is, this word unmovable is stronger than the word steadfast. Steadfast has to do with our inner doubts. I'm sorry. Steadfast has to do with the outside forces. Unmovable has to do with the inner doubts that we have. All of us, because we are flesh, wrestle with the flesh. Paul explained that very clearly in Romans 6 and 7. There is always a wrestling match going on in us between the spirit man and the flesh man. Can I tell somebody right there? You may not know it. Let me get somebody out on that. Every day, the flesh man gets up with us. But we didn't have to feed the spirit man so that the spirit man will be able to pin the flesh man. If you wake up in the morning with a mind of flesh, your flesh man will get the upper hand. But if you wake up in the morning praying, praising, studying the word of God, having devotion, the flesh man will be defeated by the spirit man. If when you take your break in the middle of the day, you feed your spirit man, your flesh man will find himself shrieking. When you get home from work, before you start to complain about your day, tell the Lord, thank you. Your flesh man will be stronger than the spirit man that will call. It wants you to complain. It wants you to say, it doesn't matter. The spirit man will defeat the flesh man. And right before you go to bed, anyway, when you would be worried about whether or not your alarm is going to wake you up on time. When you go to bed at night and you're worried about whether or not your alarm system will catch anybody trying to come in, pray and say, Lord, I know I got breaks. Lord, I know I got this Apple Watch that's going to go off, but Lord, I'm asking you to watch over me all night long. Lord, I'm asking you to wake me up in the morning with new and with a right mind. That's what I'm moving with. I'm just, I'm clinging, I'm holding on to the Lord. Doubt has to die. Fear has to be replaced by faith. That's what I'm moving with. It means you just, um, you just can't nobody tell you nothing about the Lord because you know Him for yourself. I used to love to hear once all old, old preachers and old Christians say, "I know that I know." Then I sure enough know who the Lord is. I mean, I can't, I mean, can't speak Greek or Hebrew, but I know that Jesus died for me. I may not be able to translate uh, this version or that version, but I know that God made the whole world by his power. I know that he holds the world together by the power of his word. I know Jesus is coming back. That's what I know. They can't nobody tell me different. They can't tell me different on Facebook. They can't. Tell me different on, on camera, on Instagram. They can't tell me different on TV late at night. Nobody can tell me nothing. That's, that's what we got to say. Nobody can tell me how good God is and what God's going to do because he already told me. He said, be steadfast. Be unmovable. But this last point is key to our joy. Steadfast, unmovable. The Lord told me this. Speaks to our peace. But some of us have peace, but we don't have the joy that God intends for us. Can I, can I, can I pass about 10, 12, 15 seconds? He says, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Can I die? Let me do a little dissection. Always. See, some of us in church today feel like we can work when we get ready. Or work when it's convenient, or work when we're working with somebody we want to work with. 
But that's what, what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say about working with the Lord when you feel like it, work when you get ready. It says we ought to always get up in the morning. We ought to always be looking and say, Lord, this is the day that you have made. I'm rejoiced and glad in it. Now, Lord, give me my orders for it today. Sometimes we think that the work of the Lord takes place in this building. No, this is a refilling station right here. This is where we get sealed up so that we can go out and do the work of the Lord. That means that you and your doing your job, or when you with your family, at your doctor's office, whatever, you have to be constantly ready to minister what God tells you to. That's the work of the Lord. Whatever assignment God has given you, that's His work for you. And we have to always be ready. Ready. I, I, I told y'all this on expectation moment. Y'all always see me wearing a t-shirt. And then the fall y'all see me wearing sweatshirts. They always got a message. It's either live in expectation or survive heart transplant or won't God do it. And why do I wear them? Because I want to create an atmosphere. Well, when people see me in line at Publix, which unfortunately I go to just about every day, I get a chance to preach in Publix. I get a chance to somebody say, what does expectation mean? I said, glad you ask. Let me tell you what it means to live in expectation. Somebody says, oh, you have my transfer, tell about it. I say, the Lord is good. When somebody says, what does won't he do it mean? I say, that's what it means. He will do it all by himself. What does it mean, man? It means that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly. Or so we ask him, that's, that's what it means. And so what I'm saying is when it's children of God, we have to go out looking, praying, asking God, God, use me today for your glory. When we get to the place where we are living in expectation and living ready for God to work in us and we have a mind to be abounding in the work of the Lord, we'll find ourselves going to bed not just tired, but we're going to go to bed refreshing. I had a productive day in the Lord. That's what he said. He said we are always about always be filled with the desire to do the work of the Lord. Paul reminds us this. And it's almost like Paul was speaking to our carnal nature. Paul says, listen, he says, he says, some of us, no, that's not what Paul said. This is some of y'all. Walking around, worried about whether or not somebody's gonna pat you on the back for your work. Paul says, Corinthian church. Y'all are sitting there trying to figure out who's going to be made president of this ministry or that ministry. You worried about a plaque at the end of the year. He said, you worry about whether or not your work is going to count for something. Paul says here in this last part of verse 58, he says, for as much. It's almost like he's saying, you ought to know this already, but I'm going to tell you anyway. For as much as you know. Because Paul didn't say we. He said, you know. That your labor. Now he didn't say work because work is different from labor. Work is when you give somebody eight hours. Labor is when you are fully engaged in what you do. For example, a person who works for a farmer, he works. But the farmer himself, he labors because what he is doing is all consuming because the outcome is dependent on his input person who works on the farm, he put his eight hours in because that ain't his no way. They just put their eight hours in and get their little check keep on moving. But the farmer, when the people get out of work, the farmer might say, it ain't all done. I got to go back out there and do some more because his livelihood is connected to what he does. What Paul is trying to tell us here in this last clause as we know that our labor, that, that the more we put into the work of the Lord, it puts us in a place where in this world we can have life and have it more abundantly. Somebody say abundantly. See, some of us are just living, but God says, I want you to have abundant life, a life 
that causes you to can't wait to get up in the morning. The life that causes you to can't wait to lift up your holy hands and say, thank you, Lord, a life that won't allow you to be down, but instead have your eyes lifted up uh, looking at the things of God and say, if you know that your labor is not in vain. He says, if you're doing the work of the Lord, God is watching. And you might not get a plaque from St. Peter. You might not get a plaque from your organization at work. But what you will do is when you have come to the end of your journey, when you have done all you can do, when you stuck your sword in the sand of time, you will, may not ever hear the pastor say, you're the woman of the year or the man of the year. But you hear God say, servant of God, well done. You hear the Lord say, you fought a good fight. You ran a good race. You, you were instant in season, out of season. Well done. Come on up. A little higher. I stopped by St. Peter today to remind us that we ought to keep on working. We ought to keep on serving. We got to keep on laboring. Because when it's all over, God has a crown for us. A crown that will not fade away. But a crowd, I used to love to hear Reverend Dave say, there's a crowd that when, when we all get together, we can throw at the feet of Jesus because of who he did is and what he did for us. St. Peter, those who are listening, let us not be confused by the world system. If you're a Christian on Sunday, you're a Christian Monday through Saturday too. You ain't be a Christian just in church. You got to be a Christian home, on your job, with your family, and on the bus, in the Uber. And, and as we take that posture, two things will happen. First of all, we will live in the joy of the Lord, knowing that we have an eternal life waiting on us. And the second thing is, when we do what God has called us to do, it will lift us up above the mundane and the pettiness of this world. See, some of us wrestle with pity. I'm serious about that. The church sometimes, as a church, I'm talking about the church, we wrestle with nothing. But when we find ourselves engaging in the work of the Lord, won't nobody, what nobody say or what nobody does and don't do, it won't bother us because we'll be filled with the joy of the Lord. Our eyes won't be focused on problems in this world. Our eyes will be focused on the promise of eternity. So you got your mind made up and you got your eyes lifted up, What's going on down here won't impact you. Because you know that over yonder, there'll be no more of the stuff we have to deal with now here. No more pain. No more suffering. I think y'all about to say about this. No more guilt. No more shame. No more depression. No more dispossession. No more disconsolation. We will have in this world the joy of the Lord which will lead us to the peace and the presence of God that lasts forever. Let us get our minds off of worldly stuff and let us celebrate the victory that we have in Jesus. Somebody say we're going to thank the Lord for the victory. Somebody say it's mine. God gave it to me. It's mine. See, because God gave it to us, it's ours. You know, it ain't like somebody can say, here, this your dog, I want it back. Because God gave it, it belongs to us. Thank you, Lord, for the victory. Let's give God some praise today.
I want everybody just for a moment to consider these words, consider them, and if they're true, if they're true about your life, join in and help us out here, help us out here, help yourself out, really, help yourself out. Praise ain't doing good, sing it, but help yourself out, because when you begin to sing and reflect and declare what God has done, it would change how you look at your life. I'm going to take my time here. Y'all start wherever the time is. And as we start, everybody think about whether or not this is true. If it's true, begin to lift up, lift up your voice and tell the Lord.
this lady before we in the building. Just think about that for a second. At one point, we were on our way to death. But now we're on our way to eternal life. Think about that. One day soon, the last trump will sound. And we'll be changed. The Bible says the twinkling of an eye. We'll put off this corruptible body. Y'all know what I'm talking about the one that ain't like it used to be. You used to walk kind of fluid and now you walk with a hitch and a giddy up. You know what I'm talking about? The body that used to have thick hair, now there's no hair at all, though it's gray. The bodies that are breaking down, we're going to take these off and exchange them for a new incorruptible body that will be available throughout eternity. And it will never get old. No more death. No more dying. We will have an eternity with the Lord. The graves doesn't have a victory no more. Death ain't nothing to fear no more. Because we are promised the resurrection. Jesus died, got up with all power, and we will die, get up with him. And because of that, we challenge the charge to live for the Lord. Steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in his work, knowing that our reward is waiting on us. We thank you, God. We love you, God. And we praise you, God. Can y'all come and do that together? We thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. And we praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give God some praise. Let's give us a praise. Thank you. 